Hi everybody, I'm David Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. We're so happy that you're here. If it's your first time, double, triple welcome. Actually, triple welcome to everybody. I think I say that line all the time and I always feel bad about I feel like, you know, the Verizon commercial? Yes. Where they're like giving new phones to old customers and new customers. You know, I want to be that. Oh, that's I just, very nice. Like, I want to have triple welcome to everybody. Um, We're doing the Summer of Heroes right now still, which was going to be short videos, one for every day, except for last time. We were just teasing about that. I know. I blame the writers of the Bible. Oh. They just wrote a lot. Like, we can't be responsible but for how long their stories are. Did this you want to try hopefully. and jam Jehoshaphat into no, we eight minutes? And you what can't. about Hezekiah? P impossible. We've tried our best. We have not done very well. I blame the writers of the Bible. Today, though, I think we can move through these people fast. Okay. I have a feeling. Five heroes today. Yeah. They're We're, all up here. You're going to love all of them. Yeah. We don't normally do the Summer of Heroes. It's just the way that we wanted to focus our study through this particular summer. 44 people throughout the summer that are just like have a great lesson in a scripture that go with each of them. Yeah. Um, normally and right now too, we move through the Come Follow Me curriculum of the scriptures and point out things we think you don't want to miss. So yeah. we're getting to the end of this, it feels like. It Wait a it? minute. That was so confusing because it's July. And we still the are end going of the till summer. December. The end of the <laughs> summer is what I'm trying to say. Okay. We're also almost getting to the end of the history of the Bible next week. Yeah. So, okay, just follow along for a second. The two kingdoms split right here, northern and southern kingdom. Northern kingdom taken away by Assyria. We read that at the beginning of last time. And the ten tribes scattered, and that's the end of the ten tribes. All these boys, clear from here. Now, the end of the ten tribes. Okay, the southern two kingdom left. Who of they? Judah, Judah and Benjamin, and any of the escapees from the north who joined with them, they have been going along also. And then they are actually, it's written right here. We don't have the sticker yet because it comes with Jeremiah and um, at the end of Isaiah. The southern kingdom is going to be taken captive by um, Babylon. Okay? Which happened last week in 2 Kings 25. And the Book of Mormon starts right, right. here. Okay, Kay. here's the Book of Mormon starting, and it's going this way is the Book of Mormon. Okay. We're, he we're Jewish. We're Hebrew right now. We're right. reading right Do you to know left. who we needed? Hold that for a second up okay. really, really tall. Okay. Is this little guy. Oh. I, I forgot one last week, everybody. Oh, you did. You're right. Babylon should have been right here. Because remember, they're the ones that take them away. Okay. Okay, then what's going to happen today is we're adding three, these three pieces on. Persia, the kingdom of Persia, is going to conquer the kingdom of Babylon. So now they inherit a bunch of Jewish captives because they've been in Babylon for 70 years. We're going to talk a lot more about this, but they're in Babylon for 70 years. Today we start with when Persia takes over. Babylon inherits all these Jews and they're like, what do we do with them? And they decide to send them back. They send them back to Jerusalem. And those are the stories today. And you are going to meet three people. One of them is Ezra. Okay. He's part of the going back. And you're also going to meet Nehemiah and do his story. He's a part of the going back. And then there's one other fellow who's not on the timeline, uh, Zerubbabel, and he's a part of the going back. So Okay, so these guys are all going back. So let's just talk about the timeline. This is when the timeline is going to become so important. Last week, the end of the Northern Kingdom. I think you've said that the last I know, four weeks. <laughs> I know, but you just, this is when my mind is like, I need to see it. End of the Northern Kingdom. Then we add these. We're going to come back and get these. So don't panic. We're going to come back. Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, we talked about Josiah. Then they go into captivity. The Book of Mormon starts. They're in Babylon. They're going to be there for 70 years. We don't get to read any of this in the history, but we do get to read about it in the prophets. So we are going to come back to it. Now the history goes from the captivity into here, Persia, Ezra. These guys we're going to talk about. And then next week, one more, Esther. Esther. Spoiler alert. And then what is going to happen is... We're going to start over clear back here. And fill in the gaps. We're going fill to fill in, in all, the, all the wisdom literature and prophets that were like received and spoken throughout this history. I love that you just repeated exactly what I did. 
because my mind used to see it, it was two to yourself. Times. I love. I know you, you can tell that you were like so that you were like putting it together yeah. for yourself, which Not is for awesome. Me, for all these people who are like, wait a minute, I didn't know the Old Testament did that. You guys, <laughs> Sam, right? That you didn't know the no, Old Testament don't, did that. No, don't. Because we'll have to answer all those emails. I just know. say it in your living room. You just have to Only. hear it twice because yeah. you're like. What? That is what <laughs> happens in the Old Testament? Wait, say it again. Now they could have you do it one more time. Next week. Okay. I'm going to do it next week with Esther, you guys. Okay, today our five heroes, we're going to start oh. with this hero number one, whose name is King Cyrus. He's the king of, of Persia. P.S. If you want to be Bible nerd smart. I think you also wanted to do this just so people have Oh, it. yeah, I do. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah are the same book. They're supposed to be read together. They were on the same scroll. They are the same big story altogether. Like one without, the, it doesn't make sense. There are two halves that go together. Um, here at the beginning of Ezra, you can put this tip in, in and it's kind of like a, a list and a schedule. A schedule? A, a timeline, schedule. a mini timeline of... <laughs> what's the, happening of, because it really is so confusing right now. The build, the bringing You back. need to tell them what they're looking at. Okay, what you're looking at right here is a timeline on um, this side of it that just talks about like, when Persia takes over, and then when the different people that we're gonna talk about get sent back to Jerusalem. Esther's in there also squeezed into that timeline so, so you can those see people, just where let me that you. goes. I'm gonna help you right okay, now. Okay, because I can't see it backwards. You just okay. hold that. Okay, as we go through today, what we're gonna talk about is King Cyrus first, who sends back a man named Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple. Um, then about 60 years later, Ezra is going to be sent back and Nehemiah in like a second and third wave back to Jerusalem. Not all the Jews went back at the same time. They went back in in waves. Okay, so we're going to talk about those people today. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, the waves of people going back to rebuild the people, the temple, and the city. The story of Esther is happens in Persia. And so it's just kind of like happens in the middle of all of this happening in Jerusalem. The story of Esther is happening in the land of, of Persia at the same time, around similar times. Okay? okay, good. Okay. Hopefully that's helpful. All right, Ezra 1 is where we meet King Cyrus. And it says right there, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So we're going to get to this, but it begins with a hyperlink to Jeremiah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a ton of times when scriptures like refer to themselves in other scriptures in Old Testament, but this is one of the times where it happens where it says, so clearly they had the writings of Jeremiah when they were writing this, right? So um, Jeremiah prophesies and says, you are going to go into captivity. He's, we're going to get to those words, but he for gives 70 years, for 70 years. Him. And he says, but you are going to be released. Someone's going to take over your enemy and a restoration is going to begin. And it was a great book of hope to a people who were about to be taken away into captivity because Jeremiah is the prophet when they were taken away into captivity. So Jeremiah and Lehi would have been companion prophets yeah. at the time. Lehi got to leave. Jeremiah stays and goes with the people into captivity. You are going to fall in love with Jeremiah when we get to his book. But so, right now we just have that. This verse 1, this is really, really important because it starts off with this hope by hearkening back to Jeremiah's prophecies of hope. Where it's just like you almost begin the book of Ezra and Nehemiah thinking, oh my gosh, is this it? Is this the promised like rebuilding and restoration. Is is this when Isaiah said, and the temple will be built in the mountains of the Lord and all nations will flow unto it? Is this when the great messianic king is going to come from the line of David? Is this it? Is this? So it, it starts off with this anticipation of this might be the great and grand gathering and restoration event. Um, and as part of that, it says in verse one, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom and he put it in writing also. And he said, thus saith the king of Persia, Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. I'm the boss of the whole world. And he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Um, And 
then says to everybody, who is there among you of all this people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem and allows any of the captive members, the house of Israel, I mean of Judah to go back to Jerusalem to build this place up. Which doesn't sound like super amazing when you just read it at first glance because you're like, oh, now another good king who's going to return everyone to God. The shocker is that he actually isn't Jewish. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't even believe, well, he, he does obviously believe in this God, but but we, he's not Jewish. He's not from Jerusalem. He's not going to go back and worship in the temple. He, he, that's the shocker of the story is, why, how does King Cyrus's heart get stirred up? Yeah, and, and that he's so, yeah, yeah. It is like, a, and it's this major outsider and a conqueror that you're kind of like, why would you be on Team Judah? Yes. Right now. Um, there's one of these great quotes that we love. Um, by... Yeah, because you love this before you even read this quote, is this. Sometimes, because we, um, sometimes within the church, our language by accident, we talk about having the gift of the Holy Ghost, which makes us feel like we have ownership of the Spirit talking to people. And I think we sometimes forget the Spirit can actually talk to people who are outside of the Church of Jesus Christ. Well, Latter-day maybe a better word Saints. is he, he does. Yes. Talk to people, what did I say? He can. Oh, well, and he does. Yeah. He does talk to people. Um, he speaks to people. He stirs them up. This is a man outside of the religion who is going to be for the religion. And I love that the scriptures remind us that there's not only one church that gets to receive the spirit or even revelation or hear God speaking. I I love that right here we're like, oh, wait a minute, that's so interesting. Why did the spirit stir up the heart of King Cyrus? And then your favorite quote. And here in the journal, it's, sorry, everybody, the stories are not in order on the journal. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Because you were so excited about the drawing. drawing I wanted to draw this and it ended up being up top. So we're starting, this is chronologically the first story right here in the middle. (laughs) Sorry. Um, But that's the King Cyrus principle is the idea of this quote. Two quick quick ones. Elder Ezra Taft Benson, God, the father of us all, uses the men and women of the earth, especially good men and women, to accomplish his purposes. It's been true in the past. It's true today. It will be true in the future. And Orson F. Whitney, who says this, perhaps the Lord needs, talking of King Cyrus, perhaps the Lord needs such men on the outside of his church to help it along. They are among its auxiliaries. Who mm, loves? And I he do. just called King Cyrus. One of the, you got I the Sunday it. school. You got the you got the Relief Society. You got the young women. You got the you got the kings of Persia. It's one of the auxiliaries <laughs> of the church. They are among its auxiliaries and can do more good for the cause where the Lord has placed them than anywhere else. Hence, some are drawn into the fold and receive a testimony of the truth, while others remain unconverted. The Lord will open their eyes in his due time, but God is using more than one people for the accomplishment of his great and marvelous work. The Latter-day Saints cannot do it all. It's too vast and too arduous for any one people. We have no quarrel with the other peoples. They are our partners in a Mm. certain sense. Oh, I love that. I want you to read that twice. We did the timeline (laughs) twice. Now I'd like you to read that twice. That is the essence of what this King Cyrus principle is. And it's so powerful. I love the way Anthony Sweat also teaches this principle so well about there was the restoration of keys and priesthood and temples and Um, and everything. But the great work of the restoration is the restoration of the whole entire human Mm. family. And we have our role to play in it as covenant Israel, but so does everybody else have a crucial role to play in this great work. And that's the King Cyrus principle. Now, um, one thing we want to say, one verse to add on to his, because it's just so awesome, is in chapter 9, Ezra 9, 9, there is this reaction to Cyrus letting them go back. And 
it's really cool. And it says, um, it's part of a prayer and, and they're recalling what the Lord's done for them. And now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord, it says in verse eight, to leave us a remnant to be able to escape um, from where they were in captivity and give us a nail in his holy place that God, our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. And, and then says that king of Persia in verse nine has extended mercy to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair. And it's neat that they say we were taken away. And now this, through the ministry of this great king, we now have, we're a nail in the holy place. Or in other words, uh, we have a permanent spot here now and can have a little reviving. And I love that thought in verse 9 when it just says, He extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia. Because it won't just be one king. It's not just yeah. King Cyrus. Cyrus. There's two kings that are going to feel super strongly. Three, actually. Yeah, three, three. About this rebuilding of the temple, the walls, the gathering of the people. And I love when it just says that. He, he gave us mercy through the sight of the kings of Persia, that sometimes God's tender mercy is going to come through people who are actually outside of the faith community. Yeah. So there's that little spot, that little cloud there for you to rewrite in your own words, that idea of the King Cyrus principle. And he's our first hero. And the line that we have for him is in that Ezra 1, 1. And um, we chose the phrase to be stirred up. Um, to like lend a, a listening ear, to allow your heart to be stirred up for some um, great work. Uh, one of our, our favorite quotes um, is this, um, this one by Daniel Burnham. When we were in D.C. for the Chosen premiere, it was like uh, kind of the, uh, what do you say, theme phrase. Yeah, there's or a like walk. The walk. You can go that on you a go walk on. that you go on in D.C. And it, it's the theme of the walk. You guys know we love walks yeah <laughs> how do we we, we yeah. just love journeys we love experiencing things yeah um and this phrase is on my favorite pants from rome do you oh, know that my pants my no. rome pants my church pants that i love so much it's like engraved in the what? inside of the now the belt. everybody wants those i know i only wear them because of this line y'all listen here's the line it's gonna remind you of king cyrus um, make no little plans they have no magic to stir men's blood and probably will not themselves be realized. Make big plans, aim high in hope and in work. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Because one of my like catchphrases of my life, is that the right word, catchphrases? Is sure. like, keep your hopes up. You yes. know, I don't like when people are like, oh, don't get your hopes up. And I'm like, why? You yes. should keep your hopes up. And yeah. I love that. He's like, aim high, make big plans in hope and in work. Make no little plans. They don't have enough magic to stir men up. And so that's that. Um, principle there's there be stirred up let let that passion that word keeps coming back yes from, for our bracelets, from our bracelets you know, yeah to do that so, so he's number one okay oh number two i'm leading out also is um zerubbabel um which that's a great boy name for any of you who might be pregnant right now <laughs> what would you call him um, for short i just want to know zeruby oh okay rubby mm -hmm. rubs babel <laughs> um that word zerubbabel bubble is babel is actually babylon it meant, it meant um, grew up in Babylon. So he's actually, his whole life, he's only known captivity. And he gets sent back with that first wave of people and Siri, their job. Did you say that again? Oh, Siri. Oh, Siri's helping. Siri really wants to be a part of this lesson. <laughs> you can't. Um, well, you can. Remember, that's the King Cyrus principle. You can be involved. Here she comes back right now. <laughs> okay. So you meet Zerubbabel in chapter two. They mention him by name, two people actually, which is interesting in Ezra 2, 2, Zerubbabel and Jeshua. They're both going to play these leading roles in there. And um, should we talk about those two yes, first for I a do. second? I think okay, so. It's before so fun. the principle. Yep. Um, you're going to see these two show up in some other place. And you see them show up because they kind of become the mascots for the idea of gathering and restoration in temple worship you know, centered in temple yeah, worship. Well, and this going back, like right. what you were talking about at the beginning, it was like this big thing. They were like, we're going back. This is going to be the rebuilding. There's two people are going to lead out at the get-go. Yeah. So let's just let you know this. So you know, um, even though you already know, Ezra and Nehemiah end in a failure. It's not the great restoration. It's not the final 
day. It's not like the, the culmination of everything that all these prophets have been looking for. Um, but because everybody thought it kind of was, and it is this um, dispensation of restoration mm-hmm. and gathering, not the final one, but a piece of that of that puzzle. And an ongoing work, right? right it, it kind yeah. of teaches us that there is there is an ongoing restoration, rebuilding, gathering that started clear back here, and we're all still in it. We're in it. Yeah, so you're going to see um, Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 11, talk about these two individuals, about Zerubbabel and about Joshua. Joshua was the, the priest, right? So Zerubbabel's rebuilding the temple, and then there's a restoration of, of the people, then connecting with God through the temple. And, and compare, I love, oh, go ahead. Can we just pull those two things out? Because I love that it describes their job. So in Zechariah 3 9, it tells us Joshua. And his job is going to be to call every man in. Okay, he's the gatherer. He's restoring people. That's his job. He's gathering people. And then Zerubbabel is going to be in chapter 4, 9. It tells us he's going to lay the foundation of the house. So Zerubbabel's job is to rebuild and dedicate the temple. That's what he's tasked with at the beginning. Joshua's job is to gather the people, that's what he's tasked with. And I love that they are like the ones who are going to lead out. That That's what I love to remember about them is they are the ones who are going to lead out. They're going to come and they call them there in verse 12. Is this where you were going to yeah, go? Yeah. Um, the two olive branches. And candlesticks. The and candlesticks. Two. And in 14, the two anointed ones um, that are going to be in Jerusalem. Which we've heard that before, right? We've heard that phrase before. Well, you'll hear it after. We've heard it before. But now John, the revelator in the book of Revelation, is going to draw an illusion upon these two. Because they at one time were the gatherers and those that laid the foundation of the temple, he uses them as an allusion to that happening again. It's almost like if you say a particular prophet that they're known for, you like, you can recall like what their work is. If you're like, that person's like Moses, you're like, oh, I know then kind of what he's, he's going to do, he does, you know, or whatever. And so if John the Revelator in chapter 11 of Revelation will bring up Zerubbabel and Joshua, he'll actually call them by their code names, anointed ones <laughs> and candlesticks, Let's all read the branches. It. Oh, Let's yeah, read yeah. It. It'd be so fun to read it. So he says this in Revelation 11, um, that they're going to come in verse two to the holy city and tread it underfoot for 40 and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Sack cloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And then it, it, remember, we read this into it. They're going to be able to give their testimony. No one will be able to hurt them. They can shut the heavens if they want to. They can turn the waters to blood. And when they have finished their testimony, it t- says they will be killed. And then they will lie in the streets of the great city um, for three days and a half. And the whole world will rejoice when they're gone. So when we're reading about those two prophets in the book of Revelation, we talk more about this in our master class. But when we're reading about those two prophets, the candlesticks, the anointed ones, you want to write in your book of Revelation, this is where we are introduced to the concept of what those two prophets will represent. We actually don't know who those two prophets are in the book of Revelation, but we do know their job, what it's referring to, is right. someone who would restore and gather. And rebuild. The, and rebuild. And the, so the, that's the illusion. The, the illusion is back to this original story. John the Revelator assumes you know the story of what happened in Ezra in order to learn the lesson and the themes that he's trying to point out. That, um, that if you don't know about, we did a master class on the book of Revelation last year more coming by the way but um you can find those on the our on our website uh, don't miss study.com under courses if you want to get into the book of revelation more 
Um, we just love that you meet these guys here, yeah. that you're going to meet Zerubbabel and Joshua, and their job is to bring about this, this uh, gathering and restoration, which I a little bit love because we also live in a time of gathering and restoration. Right, so right. the, the, the um, mission of these two yeah. prophets should feel comfortable to us. So if you go to, um, there are a couple verses here in the journal we want to point out with them. That first one is a repeat of Ezra 1 in verse 3. I just love that, that, that idea of mm. who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord. And that was the call. And people answered the call and they went, Zerubbabel, Joshua leading the charge, and you go into verse five, uh, or excuse me, chapter five, when they get there, and it says in verse two, P.S. in verse one, you can see there's Haggai and there's Zechariah, who we just quoted from in verse one. You see them all popping up everywhere. Verse two, then rose up <laughs> Zerubbabel, the son, and Joshua, and they began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them, I love this line, were the prophets of God helping them. I love that idea of arm in arm, mm -hmm. right? That there isn't a prophet who's dictating, every, but he's just like, we are building this together. together. This is what we're, we're doing. Um, and then verse 11 is, uh, as they build and, and work and everything, they say, in answer to the people trying to stop them, they say, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that was built these many years ago. Um, and that's, um, their lesson, and it's our word for the week, <laughs> all put up. The lesson for Zerubbabel in, in 5.2 is he began to build. Like he just started a work, and his work was a building work mm -hmm. versus a tearing down when Babylon tore down. And now Persia's inviting them to build back mm -hmm. up, and that's our word for the week. Yeah, let's to, talk about to it. build, and here's um, the, the Hebrew word bana, to build literally and figuratively, to make, to repair, and also a word, surely. Um, and I love that idea of it can be figuratively or literally, mm -hmm. like I am a builder. That's what we want Zerubbabel to kind of become the mascot for us for, is yeah. like, right, to be a um, builder. And I love the thought of it right now too, because, um, for years I've said, and then it's been so fun because I've met other women who have said the same thing, that my prayer every single morning is, how can I help build? That's what I want to do. I don't even care where he uses me. Put me anywhere. I just want to be a builder. And if you need me here right now, I will build here. And if you need me somewhere else, I will go build there. But what I want to do every day for the rest of my life is just build and how can I build? And it's interesting because we live in a time of so much tearing down, mm -hmm. tearing down of religion, tearing down of faith, tearing down of even um, how things are run. We, we get together and what we want to do in conversations and socially and culturally is actually tear down which is so interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it till when you were just reading that. And I was like, well, where are the builders? Where are the people who are entering into those conversations and are like, no, I, I actually came to build. I, I want to build the kingdom. I want to build my faith community. I want to enter into those conversations where other people are complaining and tearing down and say, listen, how can we build here? How could we make this back to what it is meant to represent yeah you didn't want someone standing there and pointing out everything that was like wrong with like what was broken it's like well look at that that's gonna hurt somebody and that's probably gonna fall on somebody and it's like well then get in and like yes work. be a part of it and yeah, build. build yeah yeah such an Ooh, awesome word it's for all so this good. now if you're gonna read all of this three through seven what happens in the middle before we move on to ezra mm -hmm. is um they have the people who were leftovers you know in the land this is sort of where you get the the little, I love that you just called them leftovers. Remember where they stayed, yeah. you know, whatever. <laughs> well, um, the, and they're the Samaritans. And this is where now this kind of like budding heads that you see in the New Testament with the Samaritans, this is kind of where it begins. So they're trying to oppose to it. And they actually write a tattletale letter to the new king of Persia. There's a new king that's there. And they say, you've got this people. You should look up their history books because they're kind of a rebellious people. And he looks up the history books and he sees, oh my gosh, yes, they are. And he says, stop building the temple. 
And then they write another letter back and they're like, actually, you should look at your other history books that say <laughs> your, um, your boy Cyrus commissioned us to do this and like sent us to do this. And so he goes and he looks up those history books and he's like, oh yeah, you're right. And then he writes a decree and says, they're allowed to rebuild the temple, Isaiah, and you can have all any money that you want or anything to help you do that. So they build, um, they rebuild that temple and they dedicate it. And that's chapter six, this great dedicatory prayer. Then we're going to move into the next wave of, um, is of, um, Jews that are going to come back to Jerusalem. So Ezra is the first one we're going to meet, and we start meeting him in Ezra 7, but don't get confused because then we're going to go to Nehemiah 8 from there because these books really are overlapping. There's a couple things you want to know about Ezra. One of them is what makes him a hero to us, is it tells us this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Um, I, we love that he was ready. Like he already knew everything he needed to know to just, when they were like, somebody needs to go up and continue this work. He was like, oh, I'm ready. Yeah, I could go and do it. We love that. Um, we also know in verse 10 of Ezra 7, 10, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it. I love those three thoughts about him. Like he's like, I'm going to learn it. Then I'm going to actually do it. And then I'm going to become a teacher of it. I'm going to teach other people how to do the same thing I did. There is so much power in that. Um, he wanted to do after the will of God. It tells us in verse 18 and that in verse 23, I love this. He wanted it to be diligently done. And I love that word diligence. Just thinking about what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean to be diligent to something? And then in verse 28, it just tells us he was strengthened as the hand of the Lord, my God, was upon me. And I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go with me and do this work. And I love that thought of like, he's feeling so inclined. I need to go and do this. I'm going to go and build. I feel called to make a difference in the kingdom. But then I love that he's like, who should I take? Like who, who should come with me? Yeah. And that he's well, and it's out. cool also that he was like, there's that whole concept of I was ready for it before the call ever came. Like yes. I was like at a drop of a hat, I could have been ready yeah. to do whatever. And I've he been surrounded myself. himself with the type of people that he's like, oh, and I could take you and you, like if you sat down right now and you were like, okay, I'm going to build the kingdom right now. Who should I take? Hmm. Who should I take with me? Hmm. And who wants to be part of what I am doing right now? Whatever you feel called to do. And I just, I love that that's how Ezra was. Why is it so much easier to like, like rally people to build things literally instead of figuratively? You know, I feel yes. like if we, you know, had like, oh, we got to rebuild this house or something like yes. that. You could like, there's something yes. about it where I can see it happening, but literally, I mean, but figuratively it's, it's so much harder yes. to like, you know. Well, and you think of the world we live in right now too, where it's like, um, like we do love going and building orphanages or building right. whatever. I mean, like that's why I love taking the boys on like those HXP trips, right? Yes. Because it's like, you're gonna build we're going to build something. We're going to like, uh, like that they need and yes. it's going to be useful. But the same's true figuratively, right? But also I think about this, like when we went to Israel just barely, our guide was telling us Elon um, that they have these birthright trips. And the goal of the birthright trip is to build spirituality. That's what it is. It's to oh, actually yeah. build faith in people. And sometimes and that, that is what I feel so called to is, right. I, I want to actually build faith. How should we do that? And who wants to help? And let's get as many people as we can and actually build faith in a time when that's not what people are doing right and, now. And it's cool to use that word to build because then you're just thinking to yourself, okay, then like, what can we actually do to do that? Yeah. Like what action, it kind of like inspires that part of you that likes to do actionable yes. things. And that's know? what I love about Ezra because uh, he's Z building Zerubbabel yeah. is going to build a temple and he's going to see it go up. And he, when it's done, he's going to be like, I did that. Yeah. And Nehemiah, who we're going to get to, is going to build a wall. And they're going to actually see it take place. Ezra is going to build faith. That yeah. is what he it's feels cool. called to do. And I love watching 
what is that process going to look like? Like if you want to be someone who builds faith, what is that going to look like? And I love this idea of what you said of like, who, who are you going to get and how are we going to do it? Because should we just give the invitation right now? Let's from now until October, this is uh, who wants to be a builder. That's what I want to say, because let's just watch what Ezra does and then see who wants to do this. So in Nehemiah 8, 2, he um, puts a law before the congregation of men and women. I love that too, that he's like, no, no one is, like all are as important. Everybody's got to be part of this. The men, the women, everybody, all that can hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and the women, those that could understand in the ears of all the people, they were attentive. And I just love that he's like, I'll show up at the gate because we've learned the gate is the busiest place in the whole city. I'm gonna stand there and I'm just gonna read from morning until midday. I'm just gonna stand there and be like, anybody? I'm just gonna read this. And um, so he's reading all this stuff. And not only is he reading it, but he has in verse seven, and I love this so much, I can't say any of their names, right? But Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin and Akub and Shabbatai and Hodijah, that wants me, wants to think about Mahmoud when oh, I said gee. that. Um, Kalida, Azariah, like, okay, listen to all these people and the Levites. He's like, okay, everybody, I I'm gonna need all you guys to help me too. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna need all you to help me. He's gathered his people. We need to help them understand the law. We, we can't just read it. We can't just teach mm -hmm. it. I need a team of people who's gonna be like, who can help me help them understand? And so all the people stood in their place. And in verse eight, he gave the sense and he caused them to understand the reading. And everybody's there teaching all of the people. And he tells them, um, this day is holy and don't be sorry, I love this, for the joy of the Lord is actually your strength. Don't worry if you haven't been good at this before. Don't like look back and be like, well, but God can't use me. He's like, no, 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 no. Don't look back and be sorry because the Lord is your strength. We are gonna move forward from this place. And then in verse 16, one of our favorite things in the whole world happens because they all go forth and they make themselves booths. Well, you have to start in 14. Okay. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel dwelt in booths in the seventh month, which this is still true today. It's called Sukkot or the Feast of the Tabernacles. And in the olden days, after they came out of the wilderness, they would build these tabernacles, these Sukkots. And there was a certain way you built them, which is going to tell us there's a certain way you build them. And then they would live in them from, for seven days. From a Sabbath to a Sabbath, they would live in these houses. And he's reading to all the people, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to live in these booths. Here's how you- And he loves it. like, this is what he's trying to do, is rebuild everyone's faith. And yeah. then he like finds in the book, he's like, oh, you, you guys, don't you know that God gave like a really cool method to do this? Yes. Like this this feast, this celebration, yeah. this festival. We're gonna let's do, do it. Let's do it. Yeah, I love that he's like, let's do it. We're, we're gonna do it. Everybody, you need to go out and you're gonna have to get olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees because you're gonna make the booze. And I love that he's like this because this is what it says to do. So yeah. everybody <laughs> go do that thing. And they would bring all these materials back. This truly still happens today. Um, in Israel, this is a real life feast, the Feast of the Tabernacles or Sukkot. It changes weeks every year. So if you're going to start celebrating it, you have to check when the weeks are. This, um, this year, it's going to be in October. It rotates between September and October because the um, Jewish calendar is a little bit different than our calendar. So you just have to go with the Jewish calendar. It begins on the evening of Sunday, October 9th, and it ends on the evening of Sunday, October 16th. And what you do is you build this booth and you put palm branches on the top and you live in the booths for seven days. You can sleep out there, you eat your meals out there, but also you are meant to read scripture in the booths while you are there. There's even certain readings that you do that you learn about while you're in these booths. And I love this part. Your kids are supposed to decorate the booths with all their favorite scripture stories. You can draw them or hang up pictures or any of those things. Um, and you make these booths. And I love in verse 16 when it says, so the people went forth and they brought them and they made the booths, everyone, 
did it. They all went in the streets and on their housetops and by the gates, all the congregation that were came, everybody made the booths. And in verse 17, who loves this line? And there was a very great gladness. And also day by day from the first day into the last day, he read in the book of the law of God and they kept the feast seven days. And I just love this thought. Again, we're going to go back to these rituals, these holy rhythms, these things that Ezra is like, we've got to build faith and Uh building faith is going to require these things that we participate in, these these holy rhythms of worship that we're going to do in our faith community, with our families, with our congregations, with the men and the women, with all of these things that are going to set up this structure. And we regularly celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles at our house. It is one of my favorite things to do. And it's something that we've done often with neighbors that will build our Sukkot in our um, the side of our house and we put the palm branches on top and we decorate it all. And then at night, we just send out a text to the neighbors and say, bring your dinner over and we're gonna sit out here and we're gonna talk. And it's, it's so fun just yeah. to be there in the evening and, and talking together about all those good things and that line. And there was a very great gladness I just love the thought of that. Well, and it's cool that like that the Lord designs a festival that's in, intends that has both those things. One has a very specific purpose. Like it's a it's designed to help you remember the miracles of God in the past, the stories, mm-hmm. right? Um, one of the reasons that it's built with palm branch leaves is one of the rules is you have to be able to see the sky. Yes, because you have to be able to remember that heaven and the promises that the stars remind you of, of Abraham, and like that God is overwatching all of this. Um, And And it also has to be temporary yeah, because it has to remind you that God will provide for you. So it cannot be something that is permanently built, but it has to have a temporary feel to it that you you go up and you live in this in God's provision right. for a week. Yeah, because some, sometimes he takes care of you for, you know, like he did yeah. in the 40 years in the wilderness. That's kind of what they're remembering. But also like there was an intention for very great gladness. You know, they were just like, how do we make sure this is a really celebratory feast? Yeah. You know, like we were talking about last week, the bringing in the Sabbath with very great gladness instead yes. of like, oh, you know, but just like, how do we like, if we're going to build faith, let's build it correctly. Yeah, know, let's, and, let's, and let's build it in a way that is happy and yeah. full of gladness and hope. And like, I love that thought when we thought about watching those youth at that um that bringing in the Sabbath, they ran to it. They put their arms around each other. They wanted to sing because it was a faith culture that just called you to participate. You wanted to be part of the gladness of that thing. Yeah, it reminds me so much, you guys, the first week we were there, we were there for a month, but the first week we were there, our friend Anthony Sweat was there at the same time. And we um, were out talking to him kind of out in the front of where everything takes place. And he says this, I got here and I looked out and and he said, and then I just saw this man just dancing his whole heart out. And I thought to myself, I want the heart of that Jewish man who loves the Sabbath day so much. And then he turned around and it was Dave Butler. Guys, I love it so much. It just wraps me up in it. And <laughs> the people, and they really do. Like, all you have to do is get a little bit close, and then they just put their arm yes, around you. Like, they, they have no idea you. who I am. Yes. It's just so awesome. They wanted you to be part Ezra, of do you guys, that. See, this is why I was so excited to put Ezra up at the very, very top, because it's just like. I know. So who is celebrating Sukkot that? with us? <laughs> me. Oh, did October I have to raise 9th my hand? through the 16th. It's going to be so fun. Okay, so you might see these little boxes next to people. Ezra, um, this is something that he's restoring and building as people and faith, you could also say. Zerubbabel is the temple. And then we get to Z- Nehemiah. He almost became Zehemiah. Oh. Um, Nehemiah. And you're going to put walls in his spot because that's the job he does. Now we're moving back a couple chapters and that's because Nehemiah and Ezra are like kind of like overlapping each other. They seem to be building at the same time, although people disagree about their timing, right? But it seems most people agree that they're like contemporary Some with are each close other. Because in Nehemiah 12, 
they're going to be together. You see them together. Yeah. So people argue whether or not their timing was the same. We like to think yeah, that they're they were there same time. together. So if you back up a little bit, you'll get Nehemiah's story. Uh, well, actually, you have to back up to the very beginning so you kind of meet who he is in chapter one. He's the cupbearer for the for mm-hmm. the king. He brings him his drinks, and, and some people think he has to check. You know, kings have cupbearers to check if it's poisonous, which is a really sad job. You but know, you love people, it about but... him because he's like a brave, he's like a yeah. the guy who jumps off 40-foot cliffs mentality. That's what I love to think about <laughs> Nehemiah. That yeah. He's like the, he, the thrill, the adrenaline, the... He's not scared of doing hard things. Yeah, yeah. So Nehemiah knows about the gathering that's happened in Jerusalem, but he also knows that the project's unfinished, right? That the temple, at the time, we don't know what's done at the time that he's like, oh man, but uh, the the temple's being built, people are going back, but the city's worn down, it got crushed by the Babylonians. Like, And so one day he's with the king, and the king's like, why the long face, Nehemiah? This is in <laughs> chapter two. Why are you so sad? In verse two. And seeing, are, are, are you sick or is there something, what's wrong with your heart? And he says, well, I'm sad because um, all of my people are, are going back, um, back to Jerusalem and, and I want to help and I want to rebuild it and I want to be a part of it. And so the king says, then you shall, right? I want you to go. This is a different king. It's not Cyrus and not Darius who like checked all the record books, but now another king who's just like, um, well, then you should. You should go back and, and let me send you with provisions. Someone else, God's stirring up, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, let me send you with provisions and why don't you get there and go? And chapter three is all the list of people that go. And then you get into chapter four and wait, they wait, start. Wait, wait, we have to say oh. my favorite part of chapter three. You almost missed it. Oh, say. It is so fun. In chapter three, it's going to be all the people who are going to build. And, and it tells oh, you Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The high priests go with their brethren. And then next to him were the men of Jericho all came up and they were going to build there and... There's Uriah who's going to build, and Zadok is going to build, and everybody else, um, all the sons of all these people, everybody is like, and they all have different jobs. And you might never even read chapter three. That is true. Because a list of names. It's a list of names. That you're like, and it's just, and everyone's just building the temple. So it's almost like they just were like, here's everybody who did it in case. It's like what cut the credits at the end of a movie. You're yeah. like, here's everybody. <laughs> Except for you guys, do not miss verse 12. And we even put it in the journal because we do not want you to miss it right at the bottom. In Nehemiah 3, 12. And next to him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh. He was the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. He and his daughters. Don't you love that he was like, must not have had any boys, but he's like, you guys, who wants to be part of the work? Like who wants it? We're building the wall. Who wants to come? And all his girls are like, we are going to come. I would have gone to build the wall for sure. Oh, easy. Oh, it sounds so fun. No, it's no question. Yeah. So they start building it in verse four and now there's this. No, chapter four. uh, Oh yeah. Chapter four. This fellow Sanbalat, he's one of the Samaritans and, and he opposes it and he doesn't want them to build it. Right. And so he starts to kind of um, uh, taunt a little bit. And he says this, what do, this is verse two, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? And these are taunting questions, but they're actually really valuable questions Mm. to ask. Who are these people? If someone were to say it about me and I were to ask myself, will I fortify myself? Will I sacrifice? You know, it's like they hadn't before. Are they going to now? You know, and I want to answer back and I want the answer to be yes. And he's taunting and saying, they're not going to be able to do it. And they're not going to bring back their sacrifices. I know what they're like. And I want to say like, watch me. I am going to fortify myself. I am going to sacrifice. I am going to be a part of this of this great work. And you keep uh, scrolling down and you find out, so did everybody. And it says in six, Nehemiah is the one writing. So we, so we built the wall. So built we the wall. I was just like, why is it? Dr. <laughs> Seuss is maybe writing. Okay. And all the wall was joined together. Half of it for the people had a mind to work. There's your answer. Sambalat, right? The, will they fortify themselves? Yes. They had a mind to do that. It's what they wanted to do. I love the mm-hmm. thought of that. Keep scrolling down. 
and Sambalat is conspiring all against them to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. And this is true in the past, it's true in the present, it will be true in the future that there will always be a hindrance to building people, to building temples, to building walls, to any mm -hmm. building that goes on, there will be an opposition to it. And, and so what they do is they set a watch night and day because of this, that they respond to the opposition. They don't, just, they don't mope about it. They're just like, okay. They don't say like, well, then I guess we won't build it. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, make provisions for whatever the opposition actually is. It's part of the process of building is dealing with whatever mm -hmm. the opposition is. So that's one of the things that they do is they set a watch. You also find out that it says in verse 13, I set in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, right? In every spot, I set the people after their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. I armed them with what they would need for the particular opposition that they were going to face. And that seems to be as instructive as it is inspiring mm. Um, to read. His advice in verse 14 is so awesome. He says, I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, right? And, 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 and the Lord who will fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses, right? Very Moroni-esque, mm. right? Don't be afraid of them. Do the work despite the opposition and you, your job is remember the Lord while you're doing it. It's very, very easy to get caught up in the opposition. And it's very easy to get into a spiral and to just get into an echo chamber of every, everybody's leaving. Everybody hates this. Everybody. And it's just like, no, 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 no. Get out of that. Don't be afraid of that. Remember the Lord, what he's done in the past and what he will do for your brothers, your wives, your daughters, and, and for your houses. And so he is just ramping everybody up throughout this whole thing. And it's funny because in 17, you find out everybody who was working, one hand was working and the other hand had a sword. Yes. You know, they I just were love defending that part, and was, building. Yeah, they were defending and building at the same time. Which is really, really cool. And verse 19 is so awesome. And he says, I said to the nobles and to the rulers, don't you like this first person? I yeah. love this book in particular because it's like, and then I said, and then we, and then I gathered. And then, you know, it's a journal. You're reading a journal. And I said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. And we are separated upon the wall, one far from one another. Like, and it feels like that. Um, it felt like that. Hold on, this one. Did give me a message to make sure it's still recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's still going. Um, it feels like that sometimes. That, um, um, that I, sometimes you don't feel that synergy of, of the work and that we're separated. And well, you're and it's working so big. Over it's there such a and, big job. Right, right. The walls of Jerusalem, yeah. building the faith, whatever it is. It feels like such a, um, a big job to do. Um, and they're all spread out. But I love that even though they're all spread out, he is still like calling to and encouraging mm. them yeah. and arming them. And um, we have this quote we love from Martin Luther who said this, the kingdom of God is like a besieged city surrounded on all sides by death. Each man has his place on the wall to defend or we would say to build also. And no one can stand where another stands, but nothing prevents us from calling encouragement to one another. Mm. And I love that. So you add to the list, they are um, defending, they are building, but also they are um, encouraging. encouraging. And so that's the work that's going on. You're the part of the story that you probably know the best is in chapter six, mm. as they're building it. Sambala is not giving up. And he comes and he, and he keeps trying to get um, Nehemiah to come down from the wall and meet him in the Valley of Ono. Oh, I no. love that that's the oh, name no. of the valley so much. Oh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's 
that <laughs> real. Everyone's you a sick of. You love to put this up against to what's the Book of Mormon story? We love to put it uh, Lahontai. Oh yes, yes. Um, right there. Where he keeps yeah, trying. Just calm to... down. Just calm down. But this one has a better ending. Yeah. In verse two, he says that they thought to, they thought to do me mischief. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a good reply. I'm going to use yeah. that more often. Oh, okay. Anytime I'm tempted, I'm going to say, "You, you, you, um, you thought to do me mischief." <laughs> That's what you're trying to do. And he responds in that legit verse, verse 3, Nehemiah 6, 3. This can be your banner verse, and it's his hero verse. He said, I sent messengers unto him, saying back, I am doing a great work, so I cannot come down. That's our hero line for him, is that I cannot Mm -hmm. come down. No, I will not lower my passion, my expectations. I won't lower my standards. I won't do it. And the reason why is because I know the work I'm doing is great and important. So um, there's something about like avoiding Mm -hmm. temptation, but there's something about like I'm avoiding it in the building and encouraging, you know, like I'm doing something great that I, that I can't. And, and, and that's, and he doesn't give up that fellow. And that's where you get that verse down a couple more verse 11, where he says like, okay, then uh, why don't we like, why don't we meet in the temple? You know, why don't you run and hide in the temple? Because he's going to get you, right? He's going to get you if you don't. And Nehemiah says about that work in verse 11, should such a man as I flee? I love that um, line so much. Yeah. That he's just like, I-, I don't do that. I drink poison. You know, <laughs> he's like, should, do you think I'm going to bail on his work? I am drink I a, poison. Am I a runawayer? No, I'm not. Should such a man as uh, I flee? No. And that's... um. That's kind of his hero, hero line, Nehemiah, number four. Okay, and then number five is your best guy. And you love this two guy. and 13. I, I forgot about this verse. He's like, this is why that guy was hired. Who loves that he's hired? <laughs> Zambala is hired. He's like, this is why he was hired, that I would be afraid and do so and sin and run away and sin. And he's like, I'm not afraid of him. But doesn't it make you want to think to yourself, who else has Satan hired? Yeah. To, to come after you, that you're like, no, I'm not afraid of him. I, I won't do it. He's not my boss. Yes. Okay, then our fifth hero is Mataniah, and he's just this secret little hero. But which you forgot you to say in verse 15. Oh, that they finish it. So the wall was finished. Um, that's so fun. They did it. They finished the wall, and then the you enemies want to wanna say, Did you want to read this part too? Oh, yeah. yeah. The enemies heard. And everyone, they perceive and they that, perceived that this work really was wrought of God. I love that in the like, end, they're oh, like, well, yeah, they did We it. actually tried to stop you and you still did something yes. quite amazing. That's fantastic. Okay, um, and then our favorite man. Then you get to the big dedication. There's yes. a big dedication that happens at the end of the chapter of, at the end of the book of all the walls and, and everything that got finished and everything. And you meet this guy who who just shows up in a couple verses yeah. here and and there. But um, they have this... Oh, you, you were yeah. going to tell his story. I was going to tell it. But it's in 12 is where we're yeah. going to go. Okay, so we're going to Nehemiah 12. We love this part so much because it, he's going to put together this big celebration on the walls. And they decide to put in verse 8, Mataniah over the thanksgiving i love that title so much it reminds me of you know when you walk down main street disneyland and if you look up on the windows of all the walls and it tells you he was a magic maker and he was over whatever thing he was over and matt and i was over the thanksgiving i totally want that job so bad and the job was to praise and give thanks according to the commandment of david the man of god remember when he Dance before the Lord. Yeah, your favorite part. I love that story. Yes. And so there's going to be this dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. It tells us in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest, the scribe. There's going to be this. And they're going to keep the dedication in verse 27 with gladness, both with thanksgivings and with singing and with cymbals and psalteries and with the harps. Like everybody is going to come together. And they bring up these two great companies in verse 31. Uh, Their job is just simply to like give thanks. And they start listing everyone who is in the companies. And I love too that that they wanna say, this company is gonna go up this way, right? They're gonna go up this this gate. They're gonna climb up. They're gonna go to the top of the walls. They're gonna walk around the walls. Their job is gonna give thanks. And and they line out who's gonna be in that group. 
on one of them is the son of Mattaniah and Ezra the scribe is going to go. And then in verse 38, the other company of them that gave thanks went over against them and I went after them. This is my group, Nehemiah says. So they've got one group going this way with Nehemiah, the other group going this way with Ezra. Everybody's going to get up on this wall. And then in verse 40, so stood the two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of God and I and half the rulers with me. And he lists everybody. And then in 42, and the singers sang loud. I, don't you love that part yes. so much? And the singers sang loud with Jezrahiah, their overseer. Who loves that man? He's over the singers. He's over the singers. <laughs> and also he sings loud. <laughs> you just love that part so much. Um, and also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoice for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. And I just love that so much. Also, I, I want God, I want to be like, and God says, uh, I need you to rejoice with great joy. Don't you love that? He's like, this is your job for today. Rejoice with great joy today. I want that job, this job of the thanksgiving, the job of rejoicing with great joy, um, so loud that it could be heard clear off from Jerusalem, how happy the people were, and what a great story, and, and a hero. Yeah. He's just in charge of the thanksgiving. He's and in charge of the joy. And what, and it's what, pe and it's what we want people to hear from the work that's happening. Mm, the you building. Know? It's just like, yeah. Right, that there it was a it was a work of great joy. That like, what did I hear happening in that place? I heard great rejoicing. Mm. That's what happened there. And and you, this is what they're doing. This is the this section is the work of restoration. Oh, and, that's, and it's so happy and joyful. Right, and you're making me think to myself. And, I want people to be like, I actually want to go to church on Sunday because they're so happy there. There's so much right. joy there. I want to go to Young Men's. Why? Because. It's going to be so awesome when I get there and it makes me happy when I go there. Like when we're planning things, how often is our goal number one? Great joy. Right. You maybe, know? And maybe it should be, right? Yes. Well, yeah. you get the day to practice this. You guys, do you love all... This is, became better than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> I like really like it. No one even likes Ezra and Nehemiah in the whole world, you know, and except us. One and of now your favorite it, it really parts. might be one of the coolest. Look at these. Yeah. Be stirred up to do some great work, something that will has magic to yeah. stir souls. Build something. Be a builder. Be ready, right? Um, and he kind of reminds you of building, particularly with with faith. Yeah. Uh, this um, I cannot come down. Should such a man as I flee, and to be over the Thanksgiving to encourage. And this book ends sad. Should you not read yeah, chapter yeah, 13? Yeah, don't, don't. I'm yeah, not going to. Start. I just want to tell everybody, if oh. you accidentally read it, you're going to say it works sad, but end sad. But th there's a reason for it to end sad. There's a reason because it ends. And if you read it, you're like, ah, it didn't work. And it's almost like a handing of the baton. It was like um, the, the great work of restoration here is still ongoing. It's not mm -hmm. finished. There's still building to be done. There's still stirring up to be done. Yeah, There's I want still you to rejoicing be like, to be done. Who's our Zerubbabel today? Who's right. our Ezra? Who's our right. Nehemiah? Who's our Mattaniah? Like, um, that, that's what you want to be like. Is who, who do you want to be? Pick one. Pick any. Which one are you going to choose? Oh no! I know. Uh, I I think I want to. No, you can't. You're in. You that has that's <laughs> Mitch's job. <laughs> Sorry. I want to be stirred up. Okay. Maybe I'm already stirred up. Okay. I I uh, I, I think I want to be Matt and I. Okay. You be Matt and I. Yep. I want to build something. Okay. Yours a rubable. Maybe faith though. Oh, Ezra. Yeah. Yes. I, we can be all of them. Everyone, okay. you can be all of them. It's okay. like when you watch a movie. Do you ever do that? Yeah, always. And you pick who Every you want to be. Every time. Every time. And I used to ask my kids, who were you in the movie? <laughs> who do you want to be? Yes. You have to answer first so your kids don't get the good one. <laughs> it's so awesome. Um, okay, y'all. This is such a good lesson. Oh, P.S. Remember we tried to make the lessons really little so you could divide them up in chapters? If you want just a really, really simple version of that, you can go to the app. And the app has for the, in the dailies yes. section. If you haven't found that yet... I mean, maybe you're already doing the daily, so you know it. In the daily section, their verse, little simple invitation for, for you. Each uh, of the heroes. And then, yeah, yeah and, and, for, and for kids, too, on there. Yep. So, okay, hope you're loving this. We are.